Hello, and thank you for joining Locus for our webinar on investing opportunities along the new Hartford commuter rail line. Today we are joined by the Connecticut Main Street Center, the premier downtown revitalization and economic development program dedicated to creating and implementing successful downtowns that meet the needs of residents and visitors. If you are interested in learning more about remarkable development opportunities along the new Hartford commuter rail line, this webinar is for you. The speakers today will share a number of opportunities in New Haven and Hartford, Connecticut, as well as in Springfield, Massachusetts. I am Christopher Coase, Director of Locus, Responsible Real Estate Developers and Investors, and Vice President of Real Estate Policy and External Affairs at Smart Group America. I'm really pleased that we are joined by uh, Patrick Mahan, <coughs> CEO of Connecticut Main Street, Steve Fontana, uh, the Deputy Economic Development Director of the City of New Haven. We're also joined by uh, Kathleen Krolak, the current Director of Business Development for the City of New Haven. Kylie uh, Goslin, Deputy, uh, Deputy Director of uh, Development Services for Hartford, Connecticut. And sorry, that is Goslin. And we're also joined by Brian Connors, Deputy Director of Economic Development for the City of Springfield, Massachusetts. LOCUS is a national coalition of real estate developers and investors who advocate for sustainable, equitable, and walkable urban development in America's metropolitan areas. The purpose of this webinar is to accelerate the creation of equitable, walkable development across the country. This program, this webinar, and our link-up programs intends to bring like-minded, smart growth local leaders and real estate developers who are interested in creating smart growth deals on the ground. Today, for those of you who are following along on the web, you can type your questions into the chat box on your screen. You can also tweet them to us at Locust Developers. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'm really pleased to hand this uh, conversation over to Patrick, um, who is currently the CEO of the Connecticut Main Street Center. Patrick? Thank you, Christopher. We at the Connecticut Main Street Center are pleased to partner with Smart Growth America and Locus on this webinar highlighting POD opportunities along the Hartford Line. So thank you very much for this opportunity to shine a spotlight on the Hartford Line as well as New England's Knowledge Corridor. First I'm going to speak about the region and then go into the particulars of the Hartford Line. Next slide. New England's Knowledge Corridor runs along Interstate 91 from New Haven to the Massachusetts-Vermont border. The region is an academic powerhouse with one of the country's highest academic concentrations and largest capacities for research, with over 40 colleges and universities and 215,000 students. It is consistently among the nation's top 10 in percentage of the population with advanced degrees, science engineering doctorates, and new patents registered. It's a big, concentrated market. It's actually the nation's 20th largest metro region with over 2.77 million people. It's comparable to Denver and St. Louis, but with twice their population density, which means ready access to labor and consumers. We have a large workforce of 1.34 million, 50% larger than the Charlotte metro area. We are a business hub with 64,000 businesses, 60% more than the Austin Metro. We are affordable. The region is prosperous, but a relative bargain compared to elsewhere along the Boston, New York City, Washington mega corridor, where cost of living is 15 to 50% higher. We also have a robust business sector, such as insurance and financial services, bioscience, aerospace, healthcare, education, precision manufacturing, research, and en uh, energy. We have a great lifestyle with diverse natural environments, cities and towns with rich, and, uh, rich with culture and history, and world-class educational arts and entertainment opportunities. We have the second largest airport in New England, Bradley International Airport, with direct routes across the country, and transatlantic service to Dublin, Ireland, and Edinburgh, Scotland. The Knowledge Corridor is anchored by three cities of New Haven, Hartford, and Springfield, and you will learn about each of those cities today. The Progressive Urban Management Associates in its 2017 Global Trends Affecting Downtowns 
found increasing numbers of millennials are moving from top tier superstar cities to smaller markets in search of affordable living, quality of life, and civic involvement. This bodes well for our anchor cities and region as a whole. Next slide. The $769 million Hartford line will begin service in May of 2018. The project will be a catalyst for job creation and retention, as well as generate new revenues for the state and municipalities. Many people have been instrumental in bringing this important transportation infrastructure project to fruition. First off is the vision and leadership of Governor Daniel Malloy, who has made transportation investments in a hallmark of his administration. Next is Connecticut DOT Commissioner James Redeker and his dedicated staff who have worked tirelessly on all of the aspects of this massive public works project. Our regional planning agencies servicing New Haven, Hartford, and Springfield all work together to champion the project and coordinate TOD planning. State and federal legislative leaders were also instrumental in securing the necessary funding. Three new stations have been built in Wallingford, Meriden, and Berlin. The stations have heated platforms, real-time passenger information display systems, high-level boarding, and other amenities. Before service has even begun, TOD is happening along the line, and this is a great sign of the market. In Meriden, several projects are completed or underway, including construction of three mixed-use TOD projects that include 295 new residential units and 31,000 square feet of commercial space a 273-space uh, parking garage, and a 14-acre town green. Connecticut Main Street Center will be embedding a staff member in Meriden over the next year to help the community with its TOD efforts. In Windsor, the first town square condos and Windsor Station apartments have been constructed adjacent to its station. In Windsor Locks, a project is underway by Beacon Communities of Boston to convert a 250,000 square foot mill building into 160 apartments in close proximity to the train station. We are looking forward to many more ground breakings and ribbon cuttings as a result of the Hartford Line investment. Next slide. Although the focus of this webinar will be to highlight the urban centers, the Hartford Line also services several suburban town centers. Millennials and empty nesters are not a one size fits all uh, group. Some will want to be close, uh, in close proximity to the city but live in nearby communities with active, walkable main streets. At project launch, the line will service New Haven Union Station, New Haven State Street Station, Wallingford, Meriden, Berlin, Hartford Union Station, Windsor, Windsor Locks, and a newly renovated Springfield Union Station. Four future stations are currently being designed in North Haven, Newington, West Hartford, and Enfield. The line significantly increases daily round trip uh, service from 6 to 17 per day between New Haven and Hartford, and increasing from 6 to 12 between Hartford and Springfield. There will be 25 round trips per day along the line at full build out. From the Hartford line, there are connections to New York City and Amtrak's regional and Acela service. There will be express bus connection to the uh, Bradley International Airport. There will be transfer to Connecticut Fast Track Bus Rapid Transit, which uh, goes to New Britain with stops in Newington and West Hartford. Please note that there are significant DOT opportunities along Connecticut Fast Track as well as the Hartford Line. Here are some things to know from a development standpoint. There is a TOD working group made up of the commissioners of DOT, Housing, Economic and Community Development, Energy, and the Office of Policy and Management working collaboratively to ensure the state capitalizes on this economic development potential. Connecticut established a $15 million TOD loan fund administered by LISC for acquisition and pre-development costs, and Connecticut also has robust affordable housing, historic tax credit, and brownfield programs amongst others. TOD plans have been completed or are underway for most of the stops along the Hartford line. Also the state passed tax increment financing legislation in 2015 that municipalities along the line can utilize to encourage new development. Windsor Lacks has already established a downtown TIF district, and Enfield and others are following suit. Each of the communities have very talented economic development and planning staff as well as supportive local elected leadership who can assist you in your development efforts. A list of contacts for each of the communities is being provided to you. This project is going to be transformational for Connecticut and Western Mass, and we look forward to working with you as part of this transformation. With this, I pass it back to you, Christopher. Thank you, Patrick. 
Uh, today we are joined by local representatives from the city of New Haven. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Steve and Kathleen to talk about uh, development opportunities in the city of New Haven. Steve and Kathleen. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, thanks to you all, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on this uh, webinar and for including us. We're very proud of what we're doing in New Haven. I'm joined by my colleague, Kathleen Krolak, and over the next 10 minutes, she and I are, will walk you through a little bit about what's going on in the big picture in New Haven, talk about some specific and representative sites that are available, and then finish up talking about what we do to try to help uh, make development happen in New Haven. We're very proud of what's going on down there right now, and we're happy to share it with you. Next slide. Uh, in a phrase, ladies and gentlemen, New Haven is booming with growth and opportunity right now. Obviously, we're the home to Yale University as well as Yale New Haven Health Center and System. But what we have going on right now is a, a huge spurt of growth and investment and development. Uh, obviously, we're a regional transportation center. We have two train stations on the Hartford New Haven Springfield line, uh, Union Station and State Street Station. And on the graphic in front of you, you'll see small blackish train-like uh, logos indicating where those stations are in relation to our downtown and some of the developments going on. Uh, beyond that, of course, like I said, we have daily service to uh, New York through Metro North, uh, our eastern suburbs through Shoreline East, and we're looking forward to joining Hartford and Springfield on the Hartford line. Our economy is thriving. Uh, we're growing and adding jobs. We've bounced back from the recession and are adding lots of jobs, not just in education and health, but also in tech and bioscience. And so we have a number of growing uh, tech, bioscience, and health companies that are located in New Haven, and we're adding uh, many more all the time. Uh, we're also, as uh, Patrick sort of indicated, an innovation and entrepreneurship hub. Uh, we have a lot of the uh, state's biotech firms located here. Uh, we are an innovation place. Uh, through a designation from the state. Uh, we get a huge numbers of NHI or NIH grants uh, and venture capital, and we are again starting up tech businesses all the time. We pride ourselves on being, as Chris sort of indicated, a walkable, affordable, and fun city, frankly, to live in, to work in, to play, and to visit. So we've been rated as the top foodie city in the nation at different times. We have obviously world-class museums, theaters, festivals and sporting events. And over the past several years, we've actually built hundreds of new uh, market rate residential housing units in and around the downtown area. So we're serving as a, a draw or as a nexus for growth, uh, um, especially among millennials, although we have lots of uh, uh, baby boomers retiring here as well. Finally, and most importantly for development purposes, uh, we have costs that are significantly lower than what you'll see <coughs> in New York City or even Westchester and Fairfield counties. Uh, our costs are actually much lower than they are for acquisition in Boston and New York, and uh, we're primed for development. So with that, what I'll do is I'll turn over to Kathleen. She'll talk about four or five potential sites that are available now or will be in short order, and then I'll come back at the end and touch on some incentives. Kathleen? Thank you, Steve. The first site we're going to talk about is 10 Walt oh, next slide, please is 10 Wall Street. Uh, as Steve mentioned, we have two train stations. This is in close proximity to the State Street Station. The State Street Station is, in essence, the downtown train station, uh, right in our central business district. To acclimate you, when you step out of the train station, you're on the opposite side of the street from this site. However, there are three different uh, crossing, pedestrian crossings uh, from the train station to the site, which is on the far right corner there. There's the, the red marker and then uh, some, some trees and then a historic building on the corner of it. Right now, uh, it's currently owned by the City of New Haven and it's being operated by the Parking Authority as a parking lot. There are some businesses using it and some new uh, apartment dwellers in some of our renovated commercial buildings that have been um, changed over to residential that also use this lot. Uh, it's actually not full because so many people uh, opt for public transportation and walking. It's a, a few blocks from uh, highway access to 91 and 95. It's a block from the Yale shuttle. Uh, it's not a very big site. 
However, with our floor area ratio of, of six, you, uh, you could probably build a, a pretty big uh, building on it. Uh, and as you can see, the distance, 1,200 feet. So really, it's, it's like a block and a half, if even. Next slide, please. 45 Court Street is also close to the downtown train station. You can see at the top left of the, of the uh, photo, those are the uh, rail lines. By uh, pedestrian access, it's about a block and a half uh, of an existing pedestrian uh, uh, causeway that's actually very busy because it connects back to the Worcester Square neighborhood. We have a lot of people that walk from Worcester Square to downtown to jobs at, on university. Since this is a, about a block on the other side of the train station from the first site, also has very close connection to 91 and 95, as well as uh, pedestrian and bike connection to the rest of downtown and universities and the other rail station as, as well. The other rail station is about uh, le less than a half mile from there. This is in a more residential neighborhood, so the density is a little different. Uh, it's a BA, so we have a, a lower uh, floor area ratio, but that would be in tune with what, what you see uh, around this particular site. And we'd like to see, uh, again, a, mix, a mixed use residential, uh, some retail or office uh, in this site. Next slide, please. 78 Meadow Street. This is closer to the Union Station uh, in New Haven, which is our, our main train station. It's currently privately held, uh, but it, would, it, it, could be, it could be sold. It's, it's being used for a uh, printing press for a local uh, business that's been in New Haven for a very long time and is very established, but it just, they just don't use this as much as, as they used to due to the way the industry goes. Uh, the project uh, is also connect, uh, very well connected through vehicular, I'm sorry, pedestrian uh, and bike access. Uh, we also have a shuttle from Union Station that goes downtown and to the other train station and also to the hospital. The Yale shuttle goes by here uh, and this is, I mean, it's less than the block. When you, when you come out of Union Station and make a right. You have a, a few opportunities to cross as a pedestrian uh, to get to the site. It's a BE zone, so that's uh, something we'd like to see uh, in accordance with that, uh, maybe some kind of uh, commercial use. Uh, wholesale distribution is just our general definition for that, but there, uh, we can see more of a mix, including some lab space. This is also in very close proximity to the medical district. Crossing behind it, you really can't see from, from the photo, uh, but besides the Yale shuttle, you're probably just a four block walk from Yale's central medical campus, where we have two other lab buildings, uh, in essence about 700 square feet of lab today uh, that's full, uh, that we could, we could definitely use, or use more and then have another use in with that project as well. Uh, next slide, please. Two hundred Columbus Avenue is also very close to Union Station. It's uh, about a two-block walk and an existing pedestrian and vehicular corridor. It crosses over what's known as Church Street. Church Street connects to the water. It's an, a, another exit from 95, as well as uh, three blocks from uh, the Green, which would be the, the center square of New Haven. Right across, you can't see it in this photo, but uh, it's uh, across from Yale, um, a medical building. It also connects by three blocks walking to Yale's medical campus. Uh, this site is, uh, is about 20, uh, can fit about 22 units an acre. We're looking for high density. Even though it's not very big, we could still be, uh, it would still fit in with the neighborhood and the rest of uh, the projects that are going to pop up around this. Uh, we have a developer that's building something a few blocks away. Uh, along this corridor, which we have a master plan for that connects not only to downtown, but the medical district. And the train station just sits sort of right in the middle of that. Next slide, please. 1-2. This is um, a parking lot right now. It's 400 feet 
from the downtown station, the State Street station. It also has a very high floor uh, area ratio. So we're looking to have uh, more of a dense use here as well that mixes in um, various uses. What's interesting about it that you really can't tell from, from unless you were standing there in real time is we would take part of State Street. There's a median in State Street as well as four lanes of traffic. Uh, it's just not necessary, but this is a this could be a uh, a huge opportunity, and it could fit into uh, the, the the strong arts sector that we have in New Haven, as well as uh, residential, of course, and more more tech. Either be um, a tech company or some other kind of, of office use uh, that could, um, again, be 400 feet. You come out of the train station, it's on the same side of the street, you'd make a right and a few steps and, and you'd be there. Uh, the city owns this as well. Next slide, please. I think we're back to Steve. Yep, thanks, Kathleen. I know time is running short for our section of it, so I just want to let you all know that we in New Haven pride ourselves on being pro development and investment friendly. So Kathleen and I do everything we can to try to help make uh, your vision for your project succeed on your terms. What we've got is a couple of um, incentive programs. I won't read the slide to you. We can obviously provide you more information on them, but suffice to say that we consider them uh, generous and um, well suited to the kind of development that people would like to make. Obviously, uh, we welcome your interest and your questions. Next slide, please. So please feel free to give us a call or email us. We'd be happy to talk with you more about the, the sites that you've seen in this presentation or anything else in New Haven that might be of interest to you. And thanks very much. Thank you, Next Steve slide. and Kathleen. Um, we are also joined by uh, the city of Hartford, and we're joined by uh, Kylie Goslin, uh, who will speak more about the opportunities that are currently in uh, Hartford. Kylie? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Next slide, please. You don't have to look at my face anymore. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk about uh, the city that I love, Hartford. Um, Steve uh, and Pat have, have set up nicely sort of, and Kathleen, where, um, where the rail line is and, and what it's about. So I want to take a minute um, while we're on this slide uh, just to chat a little bit for those who aren't uh, familiar with Hartford about, um, about Hartford's location. Actually, let's, let's skip to the next slide um, so we can see that map, please. So uh, as other folks here have discussed, um, Connecticut is nicely connected to both Boston and New York City. Um, like New Haven, Hartford, uh, you can access New York um, from Hartford by train or bus fairly easily, and that's expected to increase uh, this coming fall with um, hourly train service to New York. Um, Hartford is at the nexus of several important transit routes. The train, um, which I just mentioned, the, uh, that's Amtrak, as well as the new uh, Hartford rail line that we're here to discuss. And then in addition to that, the CT fast track bus route that Patrick mentioned earlier, that bus route, uh, or busway, which I should say, uh, runs from New Britain, a neighboring city, directly to Hartford with a couple stops in between. We've seen some great organic economic development popping up around, around those sites already. Uh, Hartford's Parkville location being one of those sites where we have a host of breweries, um, artist studios, uh, other small businesses, and um, some great housing uh, coming online there as well. Um, we'll get to downtown and the specific location that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I want to talk a little bit about some of the incentives that Hartford offers in addition to the location amenities which I've just described. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Hartford ushered in a new zoning code back in January of 2016. It's a form-based zoning code which has received several national and regional uh, awards. It's a, a, the new code allows developers um, some quick at, quicker access in than was previously available. And we also, the city also has no parking minimums. Uh, so we are very focused on not only transit-oriented development, but uh, making the city as pedestrian and bike-friendly as possible. We've seen a lot of millennials and others moving downtown over the last five to ten years and really taking advantage of that. Uh, and so that, that no parking minimums really allows developers to think big and large, and we've already seen some developers taking uh, projects to the next level and thinking about um, 
more units and more amenities and other things now that those restrictions aren't there. Um, however, we'll have plenty of ways and already do have plenty of ways to get to Hartford uh, without a car and without having to worry about that parking. Uh, we're also on sort of this north we Northeast Greenways um, bike trail, and there's new connections coming online there that connect us to neighboring towns and the rest of the East Coast. Um, as, as Steve mentioned too, similarly Hartford is a, is a great location for folks who are uh, looking for real estate that's less expensive than Boston and New York, um, but with some great transportation access we've seen increased interest from businesses both outside the region and even some coming from New York. Uh, looking at Hartford with the new uh, bus lines and railways that we're here talking about today as amenities that make it a nice place to either put a satellite office or a primary office as opposed to looking at those um, bigger uh, cities for the reasons, again, that uh, Stephen Kathleen talked about with great access to public education, um, nice residential neighborhoods with relatively affordable housing, uh, making it a great option for employees. Uh, next slide, please. So Hartford also has a host of um, anchor institutions and other cultural amenities, which many of you uh, may be aware of. Yale is on here, although that's really New Haven's, not ours. Um, but we did have UConn move downtown this year from a uh, portion of the UConn campus moved downtown this year, and I'll talk about that on our next slide. Um, lots of business interest in Hartford right now. United Bank just moved downtown. Stanley Black & Decker is opening a new innovation center on Constitution Plaza. Uh, we're also an innovation place and have uh, several uh, innovation accelerators starting here. A host of new breweries and other kind of fun anchor, uh, another anchor tenants um, moving into Hartford in the last two years. And a continued interest from a lot of new industries really looking to uh, start up, recreate, or like in the case of United Bank, move from the suburbs back to downtown um, to be part of the renaissance that we're seeing along there. Um, and then the education and sort of uh, buzz movement that I'll call it uh, happening in downtown includes, as I mentioned, UConn. So why don't we move along to the next slide. Thanks. In uh, this past year, the University of Connecticut uh, opened a historic old Hartford Times building which was renovated to host its uh, grad, primarily its graduate school programs but some undergraduate as well. The business school um, is already in Hartford. We have the social work school here as well. Uh, a new Barnes & Noble Starbucks opened across the street. This, this campus is really situated uh, right next to the Front Street District which is a, another pedestrian friendly um, uh, with amenities that include restaurants and a theater and that sort of thing. It's right behind City Hall, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, um, and other cultural assets. We've seen an immense amount of foot, track, tra foot traffic um, from students as well as others uh, coming downtown and breathing additional life into downtown Hartford. Trinity College, which is also located in here, has opened a downtown location as well. Um, and University of Hartford is looking at space here as uh, Capital Community College is also downtown. They're all sort of co-located along what is called Constitution Plaza in Hartford, um, which is easily accessible by both state and uh, local bus routes um, and from the train station. And there is additional space available there. We're uh, entertaining lots of interest from folks uh, now in the education sector looking to be a part of that renaissance. Um, one other thing, we do have a new national park, I wanted to say, right here in Coltsville, where we're all sitting right now, about to start. That's also walking distance from the Yukon campus in downtown. Additional business springing up around that huge historic reno renovation project, uh, rehabilitation project, and that, uh, that national park is slated to open in a, in a few years, but tours are already ongoing. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll touch quickly on housing and then move on to a specific site we want to talk about. The Capital Region Development Authority, uh, which some of you who are familiar with Connecticut may know about, is a great partner of the city. They are a quasi-public entity that funnel tens of millions of dollars into the Capital Region annually. Uh, much of their work in the past years, five years plus, has focused on developing new market rate housing in the downtown area. We've seen an incredibly fast lease up of that housing. Uh, and there is more on the way this coming year, uh, right next to the UConn campus. Uh, for example, we have one, one uh, new property going up and one that was just completed 
um, as part of that entire project. Uh, so we think that's a great area to focus on, both mixed-use buildings and new housing due to the fast lease up and intense interest we've seen. Also some condos coming online that are CRDA focused too. Next slide, please. Uh, the site I want to focus on for the couple minutes I have left here is downtown north. So as some of you may have heard, we have a huge new ballpark here, which I'll touch on in a second. Uh, it's a great new uh, minor league stadium that was just completed last year. It is in the midst of several parcels, and I'll show a specific parcel map in a moment, um, that are vacant or um, unoccupied parking space at this point in time. The city is looking to develop them. These, these parcels are walking distance and easily accessible to the train line that we're talking about here. They're also easily accessible to Interstate 84 and Interstates 91. Um, Interstate 84 will be undergoing some uh, renovations soon that could present additional opportunities for buildings um, either on top of, decking over, or adjacent to the highway which is set to be lowered, or that's the current plan at the moment, I should say. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this. Right now there's an active R RFP that is out through January 30th. Uh, it's available at planetbids.com. I'll tell you a little bit more about the different sites. There's uh, a large data center structure on one of the sites, but the remaining sites are largely vacant, and I'll talk about those in a moment. The train station, for those of you looking at the map in front of me, um, if you're facing that pink blob, it's on the left side where I-84 sort of curves over to head out of the city. Um, and there are also parcels adjacent to that train station that are prime, uh, prime development targets for housing. CRDA has already done some projects over there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of our beautiful stadium, which the city just completed uh, last year. Sellout crowds uh, received a lot of national attention. I can tell you from being a fan of Fenway Park and coming here that it is uh, a really cool, unique ballpark in that small ballpark kind of way. It's got a 360 degree concourse. It's attracted a lot of attention to the city and to those parcels around it that I just described. Uh, it's had a lot of sellout crowds, a lot of foot traffic. It's adjacent to downtown, so we see a lot of folks coming over after dinner, a lot of folks who live downtown coming out, and it's drawing folks from all over the state, which is really nice as well. Um, next slide, please. So these are, the, these are the three parcels um, that I talked about around the stadium that are right now open for RFP. Developers are welcome to submit proposals on any or all of those parcels or portions of those parcels. Uh, this, again, with no parking minimums and mixed use, the options are pretty wide open. We're curious to see what folks um, out there think would work here. It's, again, got great bus, uh, car, and train access, um, a successful stadium and right to the south of that picture, or to the bottom of that picture I should say, several large tall office buildings in downtown Hartford. So this downtown north um, package is going to be a great uh, opportunity for one or multiple investors and developers and we're really looking forward to uh, seeing what we get. Um, please feel free to reach out and ask questions um, to our planning and development team if you are interested. And that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, now we'll be joined uh, by Brian Connors of the City of Springfield to discuss some amazing opportunities uh, in Springfield along the Harper Line. Brian? Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Um, Springfield, Massachusetts, we are the north end of this line, so we are uh, just over the state line in Massachusetts. Um, next, next slide. Um, you know, Springfield is best known as uh, home to Dr. Seuss and uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, birthplace of basketball. Uh, we're, uh, we've got a robust business community um, with the headquarters of Mass Mutual Financial, Smith & Wesson, uh, among some others. We're the fourth largest city in New England uh, after Boston, Providence, and Worcester. So you know, we're well positioned in Western Massachusetts. We're, we're proud to be part of the Knowledge Corridor and linked with uh, wonderful cities like Hartford and New Haven. Uh, there's a lot going on in this, in this area. So what I want to do is spend a good amount of time on a couple of our projects downtown, uh, particularly MGM Springfield, uh, as uh, it opens uh, in 2018, just uh, about six to, to eight months away from uh, opening. 
this is a close to a billion dollar investment in our downtown. This is a transformative development if we've ever seen it for a city of our size. Um, we're trying to do something that's, that's really never been done in terms of a casino development uh, woven into a historic downtown. Uh, and, and we think we've created something special. So we're excited about the spin-off opportunities. This is about a 10-minute walk from our Union Station and our TOD area. Um, our downtown is extremely walkable, and this sort of serves as the south uh, bookend with our Union Station as, as the north uh, bookend. So what you see in front of you is, uh, is the uh, rendering of the project. Uh, we paid special attention to the design, as I said. We didn't want this to be a casino in a box like you see in so many other places where you kind of get in and empty your pockets and get, you know, go back home. Uh, we've got about 17 points of entry. Uh, and we've got ground floor retail. We have uh, upper floor uh, hotel. Uh, we've brought in entertainment options like movies, skating, uh, I'm sorry, ice skating, uh, bowling. Uh, so there are elements here that a family could come and enjoy and not even touch uh, the casino floor. Um, so you know, we're excited about those elements. Uh, another element to this is uh, entertainment venues. Uh, we were insistent that new entertainment venues not be created within the uh, campus because we have entertainment venues just across the street, just down the street. Uh, so they're committed to uh, booking shows at, at those venues and again, it's all about, for us, getting people out of the casino, experiencing something else in Springfield, and getting them out on the sidewalks uh, to visit restaurants and that like that. The project creates uh, 3,000 permanent jobs. Uh, MGM Springfield has already hired hundreds and hundreds of people as they ramp up for their opening later this summer. Uh, and the great thing is those people are a lot of young folks who want to live downtown, and that's uh, spurring some interest in, in residential. Uh, next slide. So just a couple of, uh, more slides on MGM and what, what it means and, and what the slides, uh, I'm sorry, what the, uh, what the images look like. So, you know, unlike a lot of projects that, uh, casino projects in Las Vegas, uh, MGM had to work with our uh, local historic commission. And what's come out of that is a really unique project. So, um, you know, one of the centerpieces, as you see in the bottom left and the bottom right, is our historic Springfield Armory. Uh, this was a building that was uh, pretty well damaged by a 2011 tornado that came through Springfield. Um, and it will now become a, a, a rebirth as uh, the cent central piece of an entertainment, indoor, outdoor entertainment plaza uh, on the casino campus. Um, so it was a little, bit of a, a, a little bit of a process to go through, but now MGM is really looking at this. Uh, with a kind of a unique eye of something that's going to give it a real sense of place that other places may not have. Next slide, please. And these are just a couple more images. So incorporating office buildings, saving facades, uh, saving the rotunda on the bottom left of an office building, and incorporating it in, into this, uh, this new design has really given this place a, a special piece in uh, connecting it to Springfield's history, but also being a modern development. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, MGM is kind of on one side of our, our uh, downtown, uh, about a 10-minute walk from Union Station. Union Station uh, just opened uh, in June of last year um, after being empty for 44 years. Um, we were happy to uh, receive a National Brownfields Award. We won the Best Brownfields Project in America at the EPA conference in December, so just last month. A $95 million historic redevelopment of our train station. Uh, this will obviously be the hub for our commuter rail, but also for uh, our Amtrak service, which we have today into New York City, uh, as well as bus travel with intercity and intracity uh, service. Um, and we've also made it more of a mixed use building. So we have upper floor office building. We have the headquarters for Peter Pan bus lines. Uh, we've got a local architect, the biggest architect in our region, moved into the building, and it's great space huge windows, great light. Um, so it's really uh, been a success right off the bat and continues to grow. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we're home to uh, the birthplace of Dr. Seuss. Uh, we we uh, just opened a museum last summer um, as part of our museum quadrangle, which is a really impressive group of six museums in our uh, downtown. Um, so this, uh, this museum actually opened uh, as I said, in June, uh, and 
over the summer in a three-month period uh, had the attendance of the uh, entire museum complex uh, for the previous year. So it's been a huge success. It's been a 300% increase, and our museums are you know, pretty strong to begin with. So that's become a, a big you know, visitor impact, and we're seeing with Dr. Seuss and MGM that the tourism industry in our downtown is really uh, about to explode. Uh, next slide. In the center of all that is uh, kind of the core of our downtown, and we have a transformative development district, and, and that's a, a, a state-designated district uh, through Massachusetts' uh, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Mass Development, a, a finance agency, created a program for um, downtown development. So we have a district downtown, uh, and, and really what it's about is connecting all these pieces. So, you know, as I mentioned, we have uh, MGM on one end, uh, Union Station on the other end, and then the museum is on uh, the eastern end. Uh, in the centerpiece, uh, we're creating a restaurant district. The city rolled out um, a uh, downtown restaurant fund, um, so uh, loans of up to $200,000 to attract restaurants to the core of our downtown. Uh, we're, we're being very, we want to make sure that people come out and experience different things, and so we have to have sort of block-by-block uh, block attractions to get people to try different things within the city. Um, we're making public and, and uh, public improvements to our parks. We've brought bike share to downtown this spring uh, as part of a regional network, wayfinding improvements. So um, as I mentioned, it's really about getting people outside, getting people to park once and, and experience a number of attractions. Uh, whether it be the Basketball Hall of Fame or Dr. Seuss or MGM. Next slide. Uh, one example of uh, development that we've seen, um, Silverbrick Lofts, uh, this is a company out of New York, purchased a 265-unit uh, complex, multi-building complex, um, just steps across the street from Union Station, uh, the back end of Union Station, I should say, on Lyman Street. Um, and this was an underperforming complex. About 70 of the units were vacant. They made a $15 million investment uh, and created these you know, brand new lofts. You can see the image. Uh, they are at about uh, between 95 and 100% occupancy now. They've, all, they've leased up every unit they can lease up, uh, so much so that they just closed two weeks, on, two weeks ago on another building uh, not far from our train station as well uh, to do a very similar project. So, um, they, as an out-of-town developer, had a great experience in Springfield uh, and really see you know, a bright future with commuter rail coming in around our train station. Next slide. So where we see opportunity, I, I think, is really uh, in, in that market rate residential uh, space. Um, with the silver brick example that I mentioned, we also had a closing two weeks ago of another a developer out of Boston. So we're seeing these out-of-town developers who are recognizing uh, that there is a real value proposition here in Springfield where uh, you, know, you can get in, as, as we've heard in, in New Haven and Hartford, you can get in in, in terms of real estate uh, at a low price and, and, and get some reward here as, as all of these cities are really starting to grow. Uh, so you know, what you'll find and where we can assist um, you know, we've done a, a market rate housing study with Severman Volk, who are, I think, the, the preeminent uh, consultants in the, on the subject, which we can provide to you on our website. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a tax incentive uh, for, specifically for, market rate housing in the cities like Springfield, which offers now up to 25% of the qualified development co costs back in a tax credit. Uh, you can layer that in with our state historic tax credit, which is up to another 20% uh, in addition to a federal historic tax credit. So you can start to build the capital stack where it makes these projects uh, financially feasible uh, and, and potentially lucrative in, in terms of uh, what's happening in, the, in, in cities like Springfield. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're seeing a, an increase in tourism. The MGM project itself is expected to, to attract uh, about 15,000 people a day on average, certainly higher on weekends and um, uh, averaging out over the weekdays. Uh, you know, the Dr. Seuss Museum. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more people uh, who will be visiting the city uh, and, 
a lot more people want to be in the city. With the, with commuter rail, you know, our city, Springfield, particularly Springfield and Hartford, we have lots of folks who live in the city and work in Hartford, and there's some reverse commutes as well. Uh, and we think commuter rail will uh, certainly uh, help both of our markets. Next slide. I think that's it. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, so for the sake of time, I just want to really top line what you heard today, whether it's in uh, New Haven, whether it's in Hartford, or even in Springfield, uh, there are a number of development opportunities. And one of the things I just want to highlight really quickly is that uh, back in 2015, December 2015, the federal government, uh, working along with Locust and a number of our development advocates, were able to create a TOD financing program that local communities and real estate developers could take advantage of. And some of the top highlights are uh, right now, developers, along with their public partners, can receive uh, low interest loans, about 2.8% fixed over 30 to 35 years, uh, as long as the project uh, meets the following criteria. That is near passenger rail, wide to Hartford line. Two, increases revenue to the passenger rail line, whether it's through uh, increased ridership or direct payments. And also incorporate a significant level of private investment and can start within 90 days. If your project meets these four criteria, you should definitely reach out to Locust and we can provide you more information about how your project or your local community could take advantage of some of these federal programs. Now with that, uh, I'm going to take some questions uh, that has been uh, sent to us. And the first question uh, really goes to both, uh, to all of our presenters. And the first question is, can you really talk about uh, how your community is addressing the parking requirement? Do, have you reduced parking requirements? If not, what's the timeline on doing so? So we'll start with New Haven. Thanks, Chris. Yes, just briefly, we have reduced the parking requirements. Uh, previously, it was one per thousand. Now it's, and it went down to 0.75. Now it's down to, I think, 0.5. Oh, oh and, and yes, right. And Kathleen just reminded me, not only is it down to 0.5, but you can also get a set-off credit for doing bike corrals. So you can even reduce it below 0.5 if you can build a certain amount of bike, um, bike racks. Great. Um, I know uh, Hartford mentioned it, but could you just guys uh, repeat uh, your current parking requirements for Hartford or on your TOD station? There are, there are none anywhere in the city. So we have no more Great. parking minimum citywide. Great. And, and for Springfield, Brian? Yeah, we, uh, we also instituted a new zoning code after um, our last zoning code was about 40 years old. So just recently, uh, five years ago, instituted a new zoning code that uh, allows for uh, petitioners to make the case that, um, you know, whether through public transit or, or biking or, or, par or you know, uh, other off-street parking that you wouldn't be required to provide parking. Great. Um, the next question, and sorry if I'm going to try to do a rapid fire because I want to get as many questions in before the end of time. Um, Brian, could you speak a little bit more about uh, some of the incentives that the, Mass the state of Massachusetts has around the Hartford line in terms of promoting uh, TOD development? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the biggest one for us is, is the one I mentioned previously, the market rate housing tax incentives. Um, you know, that's something that we got together with other cities uh, that are like Springfield. We call them gateway cities in Massachusetts. Uh, said we need a different incentive because they had been providing really low-income tax incentives uh, that, that really congregated low-income housing in our cities. We needed a different tax incentive to attract market rate uh, housing. Uh, that was unveiled a few years ago when we strengthened it last year to get the credit up to 25%. So I think that's the strongest um, that we see. You know, it comes with a local property tax uh, incentive. So um, our TIFs in Massachusetts are a little different than in other places. Uh, it's really a, a structure of us uh, doing an abatement program on the increased value, and we can do that up to 20 years. So that comes with, if you get the, the state tax credit, you get a local property tax abatement that we negotiate with you as well. So I think those are the two that, that kind of coupled together that um, would have the most impact. Thank you. Um, this is for Kali and for the city of Hartford. Can you talk a little bit more in specific, uh, about the specific parcels that are near the Union Station as opposed to North Downtown? Sure. Uh, there's several um, large surface lots in the area around um, Union Station. 
There are also several vacant um, buildings, some of which the RDA is working on putting things together. Um, both office, there's vacant office buildings and other buildings that are also looking, are being looked at for uh, residential flips. Um, I don't know that there are any, there may be some blighted properties in that, in that mix near the station as well. And one of the things I didn't touch on before in terms of our incentives, we also do, you know, TIFs and um, individual tax abatements with specific projects, but there's also a blighted property tax deferral and we have a brand new, um, a brand new blight code that uh, long-term vacancy is one of the factors considered in that. So we have properties that can take advantage of that. The CRDA funds that I've mentioned being used in some of those parcels immediately around Union Station and which could be used for additional parcels around Union Station um, also come with a residential property tax rate which cuts the uh, mill rate down by almost uh, two-thirds for folks looking to access those funds. So. Again, the parcels around there, it's a mix of surface lots, some vacant buildings, combined with some at very active restaurants, a couple great restaurants, um, and some active office uses. There's a new residential tower uh, a rehab project going on about a block from there as well. So there's additional opportunities like that, um, both with CRDA and, and other developers looking at doing projects individually in that area. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, first and foremost, uh, this is uh, for our partners in Connecticut. Uh, given the uh, number of corporate uh, headquarters that have decided to leave Connecticut, uh, what is the underlying co economy that justifies the uh, development uh, prospects? I guess I'll take this one since I think you may be referring to Aetna. Um, I think for uh, their we don't, from an economic development standpoint, I actually don't think that, contrary to what is out there about, I'll use Aetna as the example, but there are others um, that I think you're probably referring to. Um, while Aetna has moved some 200 jobs to New York City or is in the process of that before it became acquired, the bulk of the many thousands of jobs that are home here in Hartford were not going anywhere, and Hartford's uh, similar to what Travelers is, where Travelers is headquartered elsewhere, but has the majority of its jobs here. Um, so there's actually not as much uh, impact as I think folks would imagine from, from reading the news. Most of those folks are staying here and those jobs actually aren't going anywhere. Um, and on the contrary, we've seen a lot of other businesses moving in for the reasons that uh, Patrick talked about, with having a very rich uh, education sector here. So there's a lot of companies like Stanley Black & Decker, for example, looking to create that downtown you know, innovation space and take advantage of the students and recent graduates that are here. So I think, you know, I, I guess I'd say that I think the impact is overstated um, by outside reports. And I think, you know, for reasons that we're sitting here discussing around this rail line, the interest in uh, the cities that we all represent, at least from my angle, is greater than the uh, departures as significant as they may seem to the outside world. And this is Steve from New Haven. Just briefly, the impact we've had has been Alexion moving half of their jobs to Boston in the next 6 to 12 months. And at this point, given the location of their headquarters, we're going to fill up the space that they're vacating within 6 to 12 months. We've got lots of uh, medical lab uh, bio companies looking to expand into their space. So we're going to have that flow filled by uh, end of this year, mid-2019. Thank you. Um, another question really goes to the heart of the Hartford line, uh, given the fact that it's coming online in 2018, and one of the major challenges of uh, passenger rail and transit uh, systems across the country is operations. So can you, someone, Patrick or others, can speak about, is, are there current, what's the uh, 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 financial health of the system in terms of its ability to maintain um, headways and regular, regular schedule, as well as are you anticipating that future development projects are coming along the station would be contribute to operations of, of the Hartford line? Well, the, obviously the line's not coming uh, into service until May of 2018, so we're not uh, quite certain how it's all going to, to play out. But our anticipation is that there's going to be over 585,000 uh, ridership uh, numbers in the first year alone. And uh, Commissioner Redeker going into uh, 
uh, five years out is really anticipating up to 800,000 uh, trips uh, a year. At full build out, we'd be up to a million uh, trips uh, uh, annually. So it's significant numbers uh, based on uh, what happens. At the Metro North is the most significant, most highly utilized uh, rail line in the country. Uh, I think our DOT and Amtrak and everybody does a, a great job running that uh, system. Uh, the Connecticut Fast Track, the bus system, I think, is a, an example here. Uh, it came online, and within six months, they were already surpassing their 10-year uh, rider projection. Uh, so I personally don't have any concerns. I think this is going to be a, a home run for the, the region. Thank you. And uh, the last two questions really center around uh, deals. Uh, is, can each of the cities uh, kind of give a timeline of when RFPs or RFQs would be available to uh, developers of interest on some of the projects identified today? Well, in New Haven, I mean, uh, at least two or three of them are being actively marketed right now. Uh, we tried to indicate the timeline on the one parcel, which is probably going to be later this year or next year, but the other four um, are all available now, and three of them are being actively marketed. So if we've got people on the line who are interested in them, they should give us a call because we can uh, start talking about them right away. Okay. Uh, this Harvard is or, uh, Yep, this is Kylie with Hartford. Uh, the, the specific site in downtown North, which um, again I want to know is walking distance from the train station, um, is the RFP is due at the end of this month. Um, we also have a list of city-owned properties available on our website. If you go to Hartford.gov uh, Development Services link, there's a link to city-owned properties, and you can look and peruse um, others that are there. We have another, um, there's a couple other parcels that have gone out to bid recently and those, um, that process has closed, but there are, you know, I guess I would say it's an ongoing open process with the exception of downtown north, which is sort of a unique, um, a unique collection of parcels given their proximity to the city. Um, we're open to any type of development and, you know, interest coming in, so. Um, please call us. <laughs> Brian with Springfield? Yeah, um, we actually do not have any active RFPs out at the moment. Um, we have one city-owned property that's pictured in the last slide on the bottom right um, that, uh, that can be available. Um, it's at the corner of Lyman and Chestnut Street. Uh, there's a number of underutilized properties there, but uh, beyond that, we're, uh, we don't have any city-owned properties that are around the parcels, but we'd be happy to work with interested parties and linking them to private uh, redevelopment opportunities. Well, I want to say at this time to Patrick, Steve, Kylie, uh, Kathleen, and Brian, we really appreciate you guys participating in this webinar. For those of you who joined, we're so glad that you were able to hear some of these great opportunities. Uh, just a reminder, LOCUS is a national coalition of real estate developers and investors who believe in triple bottom line development that is, walk, that is profitable, that is sustainable, meaning climate, uh, climate change, as well as uh, has a social equity uh, sensitivity. So if you are interested in being part of LOCUS or learning more about what we do, please uh, visit our website, www.locusdevelopers.org. Or if you are interested, please come to our upcoming LOCUS Leadership Summit in Washington, D.C. on April 20th. Second. For those of you, uh, we will be uh, circulating the PowerPoint presentation um, of this webinar online as well as the recorded version. So with that, thank you so much for joining. And this concludes our webinar. Our panelists that we